the corporates of today were the disruptors of yesterday. Welcome to The Executives, the show where we navigate in the intricate world of executive leadership, exploring strategies, insights, and personal stories of successful professionals shaping the global business landscape. I'm your host, Majid, and today we have an amazing guest with us, Monica Seldivar. She has a rich background in marketing and community management across diverse industries. Monica brings a wealth of experience in digital strategy and innovative marketing solutions. Today, she's here to share her insights on pioneering marketing strategies in the digital age. Hello and welcome to the show, Monica. Thank you so much, Majid. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I quickly introduced you in two or three sentences, but I would love that you introduce yourself more about your background and your, your professional. I'm Monica, I'm from Spain, uh, from Barcelona, but I'm mm. now living almost 17 years in Berlin. And I was very lucky to come to the city when the startup world was booming. Startup scene was growing and I quickly got into it. So I've been very fortunate to be working on very early stage startups. And I started as a community manager and slowly I switched to marketing or I evolved into marketing. And I have to say, uh, thanks to that, I had the opportunity to learn by doing in almost everything marketing related, not only marketing, but also comms and uh, be very close to the uh, management, the leaders of many different startups, as well as the product um, sales uh, customer support teams. So I would call myself a Swiss knife, full stack marketeer. I've been um, involved in so many different projects, B2B, B2C, app-based, web-based, um, marketplaces, you name it. Uh, so I would call the, for sure myself a generalist. Nice, nice. When I was thinking of a topic and questions, I was like, I can ask questions for hours and hours and hours. Mm -hmm. And I will learn so much about marketing uh, because that's a field I'm always learning about. Marketing is something, if you're a product person, you need to understand how marketing works and who else to learn from than the person who's actually doing it for the last years, you know. Mm -hmm. So then let's jump right into the discussion and the first question I would love to understand is what made you actually interested in pursuing a career in marketing? I think it's a bit of my background. I've always been an extremely curious person. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up with the internet. I got my first computer and access to the internet at 11. I was 11. And I discovered the world through the internet um, very early, you know, with those modems that were so noisy. But it opened the world to me. And I started, you know, navigating websites and getting information from the TV shows I liked. And I studied audiovisual communication, which in Spain is a mix of radio, um, advertisement, journalism, uh, like uh, writing form, uh, so for cinema and for TV. So it's a very broad topic. And then when I started to get into the work world, right, looking for a job, I think what attracted me, attracted me to marketing is that you need to know a bit of everything. You need to be good at writing text. You have to have a sense of aesthetics. Um, you have to have some technical knowledge. So you have had, you, ha you need a curiosity to understand how things work or how to hack things. Mm -hmm. And I guess it was a good evol evolution from, um, you know, sitting in a classroom and analyzing movies to say, okay, let me create something. And I started working also at the time that there were more tools available for being a content creator yourself mm -hmm. and generating text, generating video. Like it was a, a good time to explore. And I guess in marketing, you're never, you, you never know everything. Uh, nothing is set in stone mm -hmm. and you're constantly learning and it's never boring every day is different. Um, so I think that's what, what took me into this path. Mm -hmm. And currently you work at Sprink, mm -hmm. correct? Is that how you say that or? Sprink, yes. Sprink. Um, if you, we are operating all across Europe. 
Mm-hmm. So our Spanish customers call us Sprinke, and uh, <laughs> other customers call us Sprink. But I would say in English, yeah, you would go for Sprink. I remember when I founded my first startup, I went behind the DNA thing called Thymine. Mm-hmm. And uh, it used to be always called Thumin, Thumin, like the herb Thumin <laughs> in Germany. So yeah. it's sometimes fun also with names. So let's let's talk about your role. So how yeah. has your role as a head of marketing at Sprink evolved with the challenging digital landscape in Berlin and also especially the industry that you're working in? I would say um, one of the hardest things uh, is to um, speak the language of your customer. And I also think it's very tricky to figure out where your customers are, especially on B2B. I think on B2C, you have a much better understanding where your customers hang out. Mm-hmm. While on B2B, it's not any customer. You're trying to reach the decision maker within all of those customers in all of those uh, industries. So I would say it's harder and harder for for better or worse, it's harder and harder to track people. We mm-hmm. are trying, we are in a moment where we are trying to balance out privacy with, you know, being able to still market to specific audiences. And mm-hmm. I think what might have worked for B2B a few years ago is now harder to, to uh, leverage. And I think we've also been seeing after COVID a big rush into offline, which we were not able to during, I would say, the biggest part of 2020 until 2022. And 2023 has been the first time you could breach again digital with offline. And I think mm-hmm. that's something I've been experiencing um, in this last year at Spring. Uh, how to connect again offline and online together, still track every activity and still have this um, omni-channel uh, integrated experience with your customers. Interesting. And because I know what Industry Sprint is, we talked mm-hmm. uh, on a conference, maybe we should talk about what industry is it. Can you explain Sprint to the people listening? Because I don't think everyone knows Spring. Um, so Spring is a B2B buy now, pay later provider. That's the shortest way to go about it. But uh, while there's a lot in that space and most household name biggest known is Klarna. Klarna, its focus is on um, B2C customers. We are uh, only B2B exclusively, but we are open to all kinds of uh, industries. So any business that sells to other businesses can integrate us in their uh, e-commerce website mm-hmm. and it can allow their customers to pay in net payment terms. The beauty of Spring is that um, customers from everywhere in the world can use um, Spring. They can pay with Spring no matter where, where are they located, as well as the fact that they can um, get Pay, net payment terms within seconds. So they can start their purchase and then we would in seconds tell them, okay, you can get as much, uh, like you can pay it all this amount and you can pay it in 30, 60, 90 days, which mm-hmm. makes it for the merchants very easy to scale and grow their um, mm-hmm. business because they can accept more customers from more regions and give them trust, offer them trust from their first order. And this is a process that in the past you would need three to six months to build that trust in order to able to extend net payment terms. We are shortening that, shortening it that with mm-hmm. seconds. I would say that's the quickest way to mm-hmm. so explain Spring. I have worked at Griff, similar. Uh, we were more in the fraud prevention, risk management, you know, and. Uh, I remember B2C was always easier as compared to the B2B side because B2C, it's a person, we check the person, you know, different mechanisms behind that. And then we would say, okay, give this guy a payment option or no. And then they would have an integration with a partner like Klarna or someone else and they would offer the conditions based on the result. Yeah. B2B was much more complex because you have to check the business, you know, they're the owners basically. And then yes. if it's risk, high risk, mid risk, low risk based on the industry, it was, it was very, very complex. 
because we have also had customers from the B2B. So we were just providing uh, like, yes, the high risk, low risk, medium risk, you know, uh, mm-hmm. more like uh, you might know Shufa, you know, they give the data that, okay, this, this guy is trustable now. Yeah. So we were doing that. Uh, so not a competitor of you guys, but more a competitor of Shufa. Yeah, you know? and we work with uh, Shufa and all of these credit risk uh, tools. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and our solution pulls from all of that information across mm-hmm. Europe. So there is this type of provider similar to Shufa in every country in yeah. Europe, let's say it. So that's the beauty of what we've uh, uh, built, is that we can pull all that information. It's integrated in our tool. And of course, it's been a big, uh, long road until we were able to provide such technology. Mm. But that's why we are the newcomer. Um, Mm. There's a couple of bigger competitors than us. But what we offer is cross-border capabilities. That's Mm -hmm. something we work really hard on, as well as uh, extreme flexibility. So no matter which industry you are, what flow your website has, we have uh, the flexibility in our infrastructure to adapt to that, as well as... um, you know, cover many, many countries uh, that you're present on. So you don't need a service provider in the Nordics, another one in DAG, another one in Benelux. So we Mm -hmm. we are integrated across Europe. Interesting, yeah. No, I mean, like, I I remember when I was studying about the whole field, Mm -hmm. I thought it's something very simple. You swipe your card or you put your card details online and... You know, it, it is very quick, like yeah. a normal customer, regardless B2B, B2C, it's like within seconds, you you make yeah. the transaction or it fails, you know. Yeah. And when I was building, you know, the behind logics and I was like, we have to make sure that it's very fast. We have to yeah. make sure it runs Absolutely. as smooth, smoothly as possible. And right now we are uh, recording this towards the end of November. It's peak season. You have to track the device, you have to track the person, you know, the addresses, you know, like it's mind blowing. It's very, very crazy. (laughs) And you need to be fast. Yeah. And and your response needs to be really quick. If it's not, the customer will go somewhere else. Hey, I cannot wait 10 minutes that, hey, you're verifying me as a user that I'm legit and so on. I mean, it's... uh, I also am I'm a customer, right? I buy from Amazon, eBay, and so on. I would like the transaction to go as smoothly as possible, as quickly as possible. Yeah. I don't want to sit there waiting 10 minutes. Yeah, they're, they, they are verifying my information. You know, they're verifying my, my credit card. So, um, and, and the whole domain. Mm. Uh, I remember this is a very special domain. You cannot run ads like, like uh, any other business. Hey, you, we have a SaaS solution for HR. We have uh, something like this. So let's let's talk about unique marketing strategies you have implemented in, in Sprink for effective remote marketing management because it's something I think it's key in FinTech. It's very hard to get customers. Yes. And then you're fighting against Klarna. <laughs> yes. Well, um, I think once one of the biggest decisions we've done is to focus ourselves in companies that are working cross-border. So we need merchants that um, are present in more than one European country. So they are already a particular size. But as well, we are combining, you know, our um, cross-border capabilities with teams on the ground. So we have sales teams in um, Netherlands, in Dach and in Spain, which are our main um, uh, markets. And it's important because uh, marketing is something that, of course, everyone thinks is digital, but it also has this offline side, right? And sales, I call marketing plus sales, mar sales. So it's, um, I don't feel marketing and sales work well if they are each on their own, right? It, you have, usually the most open communication between those teams. And we do need people on the ground telling us, okay, the Spanish customer needs this. Mm -hmm. Um, These are their blockers. And then it gets even more complex because it's all about verticals, right? Because the industry of, let's say, um, you know, I don't know, food and beverage is very different from the fashion industry which is very different from materials, uh, manufacturers, and so on and so on. So you definitely need people who talk to customers daily for you to understand what are they searching for, which 
words they use to search for uh, and um, what are the things that keep them up at night, right? So that's part of, um, I would say, what we are really trying to focus on is to stay really close to the customer and um, to the different markets and different industries we are trying to attract to spring. But at the end of mm -hmm. the day, I think the biggest shift is that B2C, e-commerce, uh, and payment capabilities are, you know, really, really evolved and complex, while B2B still very much based on calling, sending emails. It's not at the same level. And I think the most important part to remember is the people who now make decisions in terms of B2B purchases are used to the Amazon experience or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like the online shopping experience. And they expect that it's no different when they are buying B2B, right? Mm -hmm. So if they are a company, they want all that ease. And that's part of what we are offering to them. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And uh, because this is a problem when uh, I, I have my tiny little startup as well, you know, and this is a problem I often face, like sometimes Companies say that, hey, you're a tiny company. We are not interested in doing business with you. Yeah. Not thinking that, okay, this startup grew from zero employees to 30 employees within six months, you know, mm -hmm. or uh, 10 months. You know, they don't see that. Yeah. So the uh, possibility that this startup can also grow further, right? I mean, so is there something like that with you guys also? Or if, for example, I know someone who wants to do B2B e-commerce, uh, only B2B e-commerce, no B2C. And he's just starting out. He will start from zero probably yeah. it's, uh, because he has a business, for example, but no online, you know, no one can just go online, make the payment. It's, it's, it's an easy to have flow for him. Like I can, yeah. I can imagine that this would help him. So, or would you have restrictions there for him? Like, no, we are not going to work with a tiny little. Yes, because um, it doesn't make sense yet for them to implement us. It's not so much that we would not work with them, but mm -hmm. uh, depend, depending on the stage a company is, they still don't have the pain yet. So if you are only offering net payment terms to, let's say, 10 customers, you still don't have the pain of, oh my God, checking everything manually on your own. Mm -hmm. The moment you grow and then you are having 20 requests a day to offer net payment terms, that's probably when you need something external because it's going to be faster than just creating it on your own. Mm -hmm. You were mentioning before, creating it on your own is extremely difficult. Uh, so then you would save time and money probably working with a company like Spring. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Also, I think for us, um, what we are aiming is to find customers, like the, the perfect fit is when they are all, uh, big enough to have this problem and to feel this pain. And as well, when they have this recurrency, like it's not customers they are buying once a year, let's say for Black Friday, mm -hmm. uh, it's customers that are, they have these requests constantly. So at this point, uh, we are very strong in electric electronics, uh, also service providers uh, and uh, construction, materials, manufacturers, marketplaces. That's probably... Um, you know, like the best fit. But of course, um, it is hard to understand if a company has been growing so fast because we check at historical data in order to um, define whether we are able to offer net payment terms or not. If that company has only existed six, seven, eight months, less than three years, it's very hard to determine what's the risk there, how... Mm -hmm. um, you know, strong or solid that company is. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that's probably the hardest part to define. Mm -hmm. But in any case, I was reading or I, I saw this quote today that um, the corporates of today were the disruptors of yesterday. So meaning your your colleague in or your friend, maybe is in 20 years, uh, the biggest company out there, right? Mm -hmm. So you also have to balance out to give opportunities to growing uh, mm -hmm. businesses. So we definitely check every customer on a case to case. Mm -hmm. So because his uh, his company is not new. 
mm. they have been doing a very old school marketing you know like yes but now his customers are complaining and he came to me and i told him hey you know what just talk to stripe and uh, because that's well, the easiest one right i mean for him because with stripe you can generate because uh, custom invoices you know hey yes. and then the person gets the email they can pay through that you know because yes. and he was saying majid i i want to have a locked portal right but these are people i trust and i know they will pay so yes. but i want to give them the the benefit that hey if you can pay after a month 60 days it's fine because these are loyal customers and we are not talking one two year we are talking 10 12 15 years yeah. so really loyal we would call that uh, the converting businesses we have so many businesses that through covid through as you say the request of their of their uh, clients they are seeing themselves okay i need to give the same experience to my b2b clients mm-hmm. as they are used to um in a normal situation right so we we do have a lot of customers that are in exactly in this crossroad we have a business we have stable we know our customers and they are pushing us to get better get more digital and that's exactly one of the things we are offering to them to be their partners in their digitalization efforts interesting we we definitely check each customer mm-hmm. uh and we decide on a case to case mm-hmm. that's what i love about fintech it's not like yes or no it's no. you spend time with them you try to understand and if you see that hey this is not a good idea for both the parties you will just yeah. say hey we think it's not it's not a good idea because of this and this and this reason you know Yes. So that's what I loved about fintech. Uh, yeah, and that's the way to learn, you know, mm-hmm. like if you don't have those conversations, you are not open to see, oh, there is an opportunity there. We have I don't know, 30 requests a month from this kind of customer. Maybe we need to build something specifically to the, this kind of customer. Mm-hmm. Or we can explain them, look, we are not your best choice, but there are all these other choices because I think um it's hard to discover what's your first best choice it's a process and you need to talk to people to to arrive to um you know like the best possible uh fit mm. that's the second thing i love, love about fintech if you feel you're not the best uh, best match you will say you know what you should go to these guys they are they are better that's <laughs> that's only in fintech by the way i have not seen other industries do that i remember i was talking with the nhr company not we're not going to say the name and they were not ready to sell me their solution but when i said like tell me a good alternative because if i'm too small for you yeah maybe suggest me something you would know the landscape and they said yeah. oh, no we sorry we don't know the landscape i'm like hmm <laughs> so you're a big company in hr space and you're not telling me or you're not selling me the system so that's something not not similar in fintech fintech if we know that hey this is better then they would send you even there that Yeah. that's that's a better idea i think that's probably because fintech in the end is banking it's business um so there's a much more awareness of this is not personal um this is not emotional it's a very practical um you know um decision mm. and in the end we might not be able to service you at this point we might be able to service you later or maybe you think you need us but then you need something else I mean it's a it's a business of trust as well so you are trying to make connections and in in be the be give the best advice and also get the most um you know clear answer or feedback why somebody would not take you over somebody and it's always an opportunity to learn right like mm-hmm. it's hard not to take it personal especially if you're a sales eager person and you want to close because um you are there for closing but you also think it's part of building trust and saying look mm-hmm. i'm not going to sell you something you don't need interesting interesting so then i i ha- i was i was thinking because when i was creating questions i saw you have worked in multiple industries you know and this was something i always get a question hey majid we are struggle we we have worked in different industries uh, and people don't tend to think it's 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 an advantage but i see it as an advantage because i have worked in different industries as well mm-hmm. how do you feel that this uh, benefit that you have worked in multiple industries adds up as an advantage for you as a professional i think it keeps you young that i think that's the most the biggest advantage in the sense of it keeps you curious 
you have to learn every single time something new and you need to you know investigate the players and it it keeps your curiosity up and also the ego in the back burner because probably you're not the most experienced person in the room every single time uh you have to learn from your colleagues who might have been in the industry for 10 15 years and i do think it gives you a much more global view right and I see a lot of opportunity in cross um, cross industry uh, learning, right? Because what you might have experienced in industry A can be something that is innovative in industry C. And you might bring that to the table to say, look, industry X was having this um, challenge. I was there for that. We did this project. It worked really well. Maybe we should try something in this direction in this industry. So I would say it gives it gives you a different perspective. It's just if you've been doing the same for, let's say, twenty years, you are uh, more comfort. You're like too comfortable in a specific way to do things. Mm -hmm. When in reality, uh, the landscape is always changing, and there's always something new to try out. So I would say it keeps your mind fresh and your curiosity up. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Now you mentioned the very beautiful word, the word challenge. So what are common problems and challenges you see in marketing? So I'm sure the list is very long. Oh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and how do you overcome challenges? Because that's something in product. I have people from product coming. Hey, we have this challenge. How do we yeah. overcome them? So how do you do that? Like what are the problems you saw and how do you overcome them? I think the biggest challenge is budget is resources uh, in terms of you're going to take different decisions depending on how much resources or budget do you have. And sometimes you don't have enough budget to take the right decision and then you're going to, you know, fill it in two, three years down the line. You're going to be like, damn, we should have chosen a different tech stack, marketing tech stack. We should have chosen a different direction. And um, I think that's really hard at the beginning. Uh to make the right choices if you don't have the budget or the resources to try things out and to, you know, bet that, uh, okay, this technology is more expensive, but this technology is going to save us pain down the line, for example. Mm -hmm. Other challenges, I think people absolutely underestimate how much time everything takes in marketing, especially getting awareness, positioning yourself, uh, for most people, they get very frustrated in the Dach German uh, market or uh, region because it everything takes so long, decisions take so long, but also people taking you seriously take long. Um, I would say an enter, entering Germany takes at least two years of pouring resources into Germany until the industry starts reacting and saying, oh, I know these guys, they've been a, a bit around they will start trusting you or answering your calls maybe in two years. And not many companies have the resources or the patience to um, stick around. Uh, Germany is a huge market. It's probably the biggest in Europe. And it's a very interesting market, uh, especially in B2B. But you have to have the resources and the patience. Otherwise, yeah, you're going to exit at some point and you're not going to have any success if you're not ready to you know stick around for at least two years interesting hmm. yeah that's that's uh, i mean especially in b2b decision it, it also takes time um and i see always startups are trying to be like hey we we put in a little bit of money and yeah. i need returns back and the returns are unrealistic like uh, i remember i was talking with with one of my my friends and someone told him about ROS, return on advertising spend, which is, for me, it's a very hard metric to track, extremely complex. It sounds simple, but it's really complex. And I have not encountered anyone who actually said that we have the best ROS report. Everyone is complaining that ROS report, we spend so much money and we don't have an exact idea of how much money we made on a euro spend. Yeah. So this guy comes to me and he says, I calculated my ROS to be for one euro. I was making about 62 cents and I want to increase it to a hundred euro for every single euro. 
and uh, yeah look at your face right now so he asked me majid you're a product guy tell me what should i do i'm like i wish i had a magic stick and i could have done abracadabra and you could have had that you know because i don't know to be honest this is this is one i don't trust cross reports that much yeah like the best marketing people i've seen them use it as an estimate or a guesstimate just for an ideation because you cannot calculate it's really hard i would say it's also a, a time it's a it's a it's a game of time right um in the sense of the first money you pour on advertising it might not get you any leads or any return on investment mm-hmm. it just puts your brand in front of people's eyes and as i was saying when people maybe have seen your brand around for 2 3 years then they are considering okay maybe we need to check these guys out mm-hmm. so maybe you would see that return on the um advertisement spend but maybe 5 years 10 years down the line and, mm-hmm. and by now you've not only done advertisement you've done so many other things right so i think yes it's a very hard metric Of course if you just stick to you know the performance of your ads yes you can see it but it's i think in marketing we do have um you know a side of people who are saying everything digital everything trackable everything data driven and then there's a lot of it that is more emotional more perception more about you know like awareness and mm-hmm. it's very hard to to you know measure all of that together um it's just you know when you do comms or pr it that's the, the the biggest deal right you're investing and you're getting a lot of awareness how much of that can be closed well you might only you know close it within one or two years because that blast you you did a pr blast took the attention of a big company but if anyone who has been on b2b sales will know maybe that big company takes one year easy to close sometimes 18 months and their return is only going to come you know within 3 years but the fact that you can put the logo of that company in your website or you can do a case study with them that has mm-hmm. so much value because it's going to bring you other big logos and how do you track or assign a value to that whole thing that just happened I mean yes of course you can but at the same time only over time because the um impact of that campaign you did one year you might not see the impact in terms of revenue within 2 3 years interesting interesting it's that's true i mean uh everyone wants to the ceos want to make money but uh, oh, yeah. what you mentioned right now <laughs> <laughs> what you mentioned right now that it's about brand awareness you know it's also about promoting it's a mix, it's, it's a mix would, right it's a mix i would say mm-hmm. at least as a generalist um yes there are companies that can you know depending on what they are selling they can focus themselves on just doing digital advertisement and that's all they need you know if you're in a drop shipping operation or a direct to consumer maybe you know it works for you um mm-hmm. but all of them at some point when they really want to get big then they have to go into more influencer marketing um into a more not hard hard numbers hard i put this ad and that was the conversion rate and this is how much revenue i got from that campaign mm-hmm. uh if when they want to get big and more recognition and get more less paid but more own uh traffic they will go into a combination of things right so i think it's always a a combination like mm-hmm. um and as a generalist that's my experience mm-hmm. but i also think depends on the industry you are and what you're selling but i think what you mentioned that uh, they need to have a mix it applies to everyone like i have seen so many people i was just talking with someone the other day and this guy was like hey yeah i'm i'm hiring someone for marketing and this guy uh, this lady suggested that you need a strategy written down first that okay what do you want as a result of marketing like yeah. and this guy because it's a startup so he's been putting ads himself on linkedin on instagram on uh, facebook and on youtube 
and then he was like yeah but uh, i got this many views but nothing concrete i'm like because you don't know what you want from the ad mm. do you just want people to watch the video like why so and and you need different campaigns right because you need a first campaign that is just oh they've seen this ad with this brand that sells these oh that's information only and then they get another one that goes into a bit more detail and then at, like on the third fourth fifth ad they see it's going to be the the hard sell but if you're only putting one type of ad one type of campaign in front of them and you don't keep nurturing um it's not going to going to work it's always a very slow cascade mm-hmm. and as usual or typical is that nobody has time for that right nobody sees the need of that flow to arrive right the mm-hmm. river to make it to the sea um it takes it takes a, a lot of time a lot of effort and that's tied to what i was saying i think a big uh challenge in marketing is to to people to accept is not a one day to another and i always joke about that nobody knows what mark what marketing is doing until marketing is gone and there's no ma- no one else to do anything else right that's true and that's you true. you miss marketing once it's gone but when when it's there is like what does marketing do all day right i i I'm, get that a lot i i i can understand <coughs> it's the same with legal every department has this okay what are you guys doing like oh you're chilling right no work and then uh, ev- every department is important yeah. like i learned the importance how critical legal is when i was working in fintech yeah. because the implications if you do something wrong are massive it can completely destroy the company but interesting and now uh, because you're all you have been a full time traveler uh, first let's ask how many countries have you traveled to so far i'm not keeping score <laughs> uh, i would say uh, so many people keep score uh i don't uh i think i'm probably in the 40s 50s easy okay that's that's um, good i think uh it's been one of the best decisions i ever did to you know take time off from day to day work and just go for 8 months traveling 7 months traveling part mm-hmm. of it i did it with my former partner some of it i did it on my own definitely has a completely different texture to go with, as a couple to um versus go as a lone traveler especially as as a woman um i think best investment ever um in money i will never um you know like regret having spent uh it helps you so much to understand the world in a different way seeing that you know in germany there is like a definite way to do everything and like germans have a very specific idea of how things should be done and i am a bit like that as well so that's why when i arrived to germany i was like oh i'm in heaven i, I like these people these are my people but when you travel you realize no the other countries also work they don't work as much as a clockwork or they don't work so rigidly but things happen and things mm. work and you know like everyone arrives to a same end result the path is different and yeah it might take longer but you might enjoy it more I think maybe in Germany we are in a very straight line mm. but it's not an enjoyable experience for most of us um while other countries takes longer maybe mm. but there is a more human quality or there's a bigger warmth or there's more learning and more interpersonal mm. contact um so yeah I think it helps you to understand you know we all share common needs and each culture or each country sorts them or solves them in a different way mm. so i think it it gives you so much experience about human nature human psychology and that you know a smile goes a long way no no matter where you are people understand what a smile is you can, you might not speak the same language but you know if i bring you a present and i do this people understand this is a present and if um you know like if i say thank you 
you know, even if you don't understand, thank you as a word. If I do this, people understand, people oh, understand. this person is grateful or this person is, a, you know, trying to do something. Mm -hmm. nice. So, yeah, I've, I've had, I was lucky to travel a lot. Yes. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And you partly answered my question that I was going to ask at how has it influenced you in terms of marketing? You, you didn't mention about how did it personally influence you? Yeah. Uh, with the examples you came, but how did it influence you in terms of approaching in marketing? In terms of marketing, I think that it helped me to understand that every audience is different and you need to understand what are the things that you need to answer first. For example, there's this, um, there's this book called The Culture Map and it's about how to work in different cultures and it gives examples, like there's cultures that need first the big picture, and then you go to the details. And mm -hmm. then there's countries they need that you give the details, and then you arrive to a conclusion. Because if you arrive to the conclusion without explaining the process, they don't trust you. So on marketing, that's similar, right? Like there's some markets, uh, some cultures, some industries, where they just want you to give, you know, give me the takeaway. Give me the insight. Give me what mm -hmm. I need to know about your product. In other countries, expect or, or industries or products, they need you to map out the problem, mm -hmm. all the different solutions, and then justify why my solution is probably the best for you. And okay. that you need to approach every culture and market in a different way. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we don't market the same to Spain to what we would use for marketing purposes in Germany. Mm, interesting. And Germany and Spain are still very close. Like they're not yes. that far. It's uh, it's Europe and yes. I mean, but it's still very different. When I was working in Thailand, I remember it was so much different. The techniques like neighboring countries between yes. Netherlands and Germany was like completely different marketing. US and Canada, it was in different. Even yeah. in the state in US, yes. like we're not talking about country, even just the state and the region, we had to adapt to how do we promote a particular product. Interesting. Like, like every time somebody I've been close to trying to crack the the US market, it's like you're you're it's like six, seven countries within one. Mm. So you just have to divide it in regions mm. and you cannot approach in for example when it came to um real estate market or management of properties. That's something I did uh, a couple of years ago. In the U.S., every region has a different way to manage repairs. It's different people are responsible of the repairs and maintenance of a building. So it's not like in Germany, there is a system that more or less works across Germany. This is our setup in Germany. But in the U.S., it's like it's very different to, you know, try to address that problem or digitize that process in um, East Coast, West Coast, uh, Middle, but also North, South, uh, urban areas versus rural areas. Mm -hmm. Most people, you know, like in in rural areas, they own their building. So it's their thing, right? There's no company involved. There's no landlord. They own their ho homes. So that's not B2B, right, mm -hmm. anymore. So you have to, yeah, you have to be very knowledgeable about what's the system in this country and what the message is that will work and in you know all the nuances for sure let, let me ask you for a successful example you have been asking talking about the challenges and how have you been uh, you know because but can you share with us uh, an example of successful marketing campaign that you have led and what do you think was the reason that it became a success or effective it's so hard um <laughs> like i mean so many on the on the plate that you're like okay which one should i tell them <laughs> no no it's um it's hard to to define success right in terms of for example recently i do believe it was a success for spring um to you know use uh pr press work as a way to present ourselves in the markets we've already been present in spain we've already been present in germany but the fact that we said we are opening offices, we are physically going to be here. Um, we had a very nice uh, campaign that, um, as I was saying before, <laughs> is not as trackable as 
an ad on LinkedIn, mm. but it definitely put in front and center our two leaders, country managers who are going to be, you know, representing us in each country. Made it very personal, very made it very, you know, reachable. Like, oh, I saw, I saw you on the news, right? Mm. And that is a very good door opening because it's not product, but it's also, you know, our personal connection. Uh, especially when you are new in a territory, you need that la layer of trust. Mm -hmm. um, and that trust is really hard to earn everywhere, but I think in Germany especially. In terms of digital marketing campaigns, I think everything that is useful usually works well. Once you put in front of your audience something that they need, it's making their lives easier. It tends to go very well. But it's also very hard to identify what is it that um, they will find useful. And so for me, uh, the marketing people I've worked with, I've seen one thing and I'm always questioning, I'm a product guy, mm -hmm. that marketing people are very creative. They will come up with a fancy looking poster or ad, you know, and yet they also trust data uh, that, hey, we have data, we need to rely yes. on it and make decisions, you know. So... One thing that uh, I was wondering is how you as a marketing expert or balance out between creativity, which is creating the next coolest looking thing and data driven, which is more serious, you know, numbers, making decisions based on numbers or, or their logic behind information. So how do you balance those two? Ideally, if you have a team, it balances out really well because you usually would have somebody who's more data-driven and somebody who's more creative. Uh, I think that's the easiest way to balance it out. When you have two types of experts, three types of experts in the same room, and you are trying to figure out um, solutions and results, um, then you can find that beautiful, you know, um, like middle ground. When you're alone, it's hard because you cannot be everything in at the same time and be everywhere but i would say best case scenario you have tools that help you to balance that out right you have the analytics that tell you okay this ad looked prettier but it didn't work as well so you know we need less pretty and more um effective i think mm -hmm. that's a typical thing when you test ads um linkedin for example is a very good example LinkedIn is very blue, dark blue and white. So most of the ads that work well are in very contrasting colors. So, you know, like they pop from the feet because they look different. Problem mm -hmm. with that is those tend to look extremely ugly, right? So you need to balance that out, whether you want to protect your brand, you want to create that beautiful brand and you want to wow people with, you know, the emotional side and the beautiful side or whether you just want them to click. Uh, and I think it also depends on the product you're selling, right? If you're selling Apple, you're selling beauty, you're selling aesthetics, you're selling taste, you're saying, you know, we do, we do beautiful stuff around here. If you're selling something else that is more about practical immediacy and, you know, we sort a problem from you, then you can scream with your ad. But... Yeah, you need to balance those things. And I think that's in most marketing teams, that's always the friction. What sells versus what looks good. Mm. Interesting. interesting. And I have one question that came to me from someone else. It was about community management. They, they have been struggling, you know, like, okay, yeah. we, have a, we are trying to build a community that what, what kind of role do you believe community management plays in overall marketing? success of a marketing strategy? As usual, uh, depends what business you're in or what company or, or brand or service you're trying to create. I would say not all companies or products need community. Best case scenario, the community creates on its own because you're doing something so good, so useful. People rave about you and want to share about it uh, and want to help each other out. Um, I think um, it is all about being helpful to each other. I think that's mm -hmm. in the end community is that. 
and finding connection through being helpful to each other. And you can always, you know, find ways to help your customers. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't need to be within exactly what you're doing. I think one of the best companies I've seen using community is Buffer because they, they, uh, it's a scheduling tool for social media and they put a lot of effort on content and they didn't talk only about scheduling on social media or social media. They talk about productivity. They talk about hacks. They will talk about anything related to the people who would like to make their lives easier scheduling their posts mm -hmm. on social media. And the community was all around that, right? Um, and I think um, in the end, your company, if you really want to invest in community, it's a good investment because once you know, you have a community around you, people will go um, out of their way to be helpful to others and to create something cool with your product. And that's, you know, like the dream for any marketeer because that helps with, you know, giving credibility to your product, helping with word of mouth. Um, you know, like there is nothing better than some friend recommended me this uh, product. Uh, that weights much, much more than any ad uh, you've seen online. Um, it takes time though. It takes time and you need to figure out how to be helpful. And it's a lot about being at service. Uh, communities, I'm at your service. How can I help you? And yeah, you need to, to spend time uh, talking to customers. I think it gives you a lot of insights, but also you have the responsibility to moderate that mm -hmm. community. And that takes a lot of work. Interesting. Community management is a good thing, but like you mentioned, Jira has also, I think, a similar approach. They have their own forum and they have yeah. people there, but it, like people are helping each other. I mean, I saw one support from a customer asking a question and then another customer was answering the question. So there was yes. no one from Jira even involved. Interesting. That's that's the dream. Mm -hmm. and th that would be nice to have. <laughs> I agree. So now because we are coming towards uh, the end, I have one question because AI is changing everything very rapidly. Yeah. Like oh, I'm, I'm seeing how ChatGPT is evolving. Um, how has AI basically helped you or how has AI tools help sort of like not replace your job, but helped you in, in generally? Because that's a question I get. Like people are like, hey, AI will take my job. Do I need to be worried? Well, I think we all have to be worried. I don't know if because it was going to take our job, but it's going to make things less trustable um, in the sense of you cannot trust every image you see. You cannot trust every answer ChatGPT gives you. Um, mm. People are going to generate text and video with, with AI that is not real. And it's going to be very, very, very hard to distinguish what's real and what's not. So I'm pretty critical with AI, especially as a woman and as a non, especially white woman in the sense of uh, we've seen this uh, last weeks, um, all this um, drama <laughs> with open AI. And if you would see, you know, there is one, there was one tweet uh, with Sam Almond is going back and then they take a picture with the whole team. There were very few women, very few people of color in that picture. It was very white. And the problem with that is it, AI is going to be a reflection of what you feed the, mm. the, the intelligence, right? Um, so we are feeding them a specific content. And if the source is already biased, what's coming after that is going to be extremely biased. Um, mm. I think that's the part where I'm more critical about what I think my, uh, AI has offered to me so far is a lot of unstacking us as marketeers in the sense of we are, it's very hard to keep up with the content generation, the ideas, and it's very hard to, you know, find ways to, to you know, produce quickly when um, it's actually very mind um intensive to be creative. And I think what AI offers us is a way to unlock our creativity, right? As, as the same way as an artist would maybe smoke 
a joint to unlock their creativity, let's say that way. I think that's what's gonna what's helping us so far to find, you know, to open us doors to, you know, try this, try that. But I don't know, today I've seen a whole thread about um, a person describing how they scrape up the website of another competitor, creating um, a, a content for all the links that creator had, uh, that, that company had. And then they stole like, I don't know how much more traffic from them because they got uh, their website to be better positioned than the competitor. But at the end of the day, that's making, like that's playing with the search and the, the algorithms that we use for searching. And that's just going to make it harder to find the content you need, the right mm -hmm. one, and not AI generated, right? So again, it's going to make it very hard for us to understand what content is actually useful, created by a by a person with knowledge and authority, authority in, a, in a matter versus just random words put by an AI. Of course, as, as better it gets the AI, the more dangerous it gets, right? Mm -hmm. And the more harder to distinguish it's going to be. And from what I understand, one of the problems um, uh, OpenAI had this uh, last week is exactly that the um, intelligence is getting too intelligent and how much under control we will have it in the next, not even years, months, right? That's like, true. Mm -hmm. Are we unleashing a beast that we cannot bring back to the cage once it's unleashed? Um, I don't know. It's more philosophical <laughs> than uh, maybe you expected. Mm -hmm. But in marketing, I think, yes, it gives you more creative paths. It gives you like um yeah more inspiration um and i think it gives you more ways to test things automatically but i am still a bit unsure whether it's gonna just kill all, all of our jobs within the next mm. five years i doubt it but mm. hey i ask me in five years <laughs> Okay, so one thing I love, I mean, I'm, I'm using a lot of chat GPT and also yeah. other AI tools, you know, generally experimenting, because that's what makes a product guy experimenting, experiencing, you know. So I have, I had this thing in my head for a long time. I wanted to have a Megalodon, which is a super rare fish, you know, it's, it's, a, it's said that it's been extinct. And then uh, fighting with the largest snake that existed Ooh. on the planet, Tit Titanoboa. So yeah. imagine Titanic looks like a tiny little ant in front of an elephant. So the elephant is the is the fish. It's yeah. that big. And I was I I was trying to come up with something that they are in a sci-fi movie poster that they are fighting against each other. That yeah. normally I would never have been able to do it, like because I'm not a designer. But I created like a really, really cool movie looking poster. Like wow. I think if I put that online and say, hey, this is a movie coming, people will actually believe that because it's yeah. it's so freaking good, which is also scary at sometimes, like you mentioned, you know, like, okay. And then there are, it's feeding on a lot of data, like a lot of data. Then the question becomes the data it's feeding on, like do the people even know that it's using this kind of data? Because... I mean, the, the kind of art create, it created, there have been posters in that sense yes. right before. So it's, it can be the same with the content example you gave, that yeah. the content it has taken from. So aren't we mm. like, sort of like breaching yes. the, them, the other people? There's going to be a lot of, um, I think, lawsuits about this. <laughs> you know, like people stealing um, the voice of actors, um the art of artists um it's it i think we are really in uncharted waters mm -hmm. and i mean it's exciting and i think we are all a bit in awe of what is possible right i have a good friend of mine who every time she has a question she asks chat gpt like just to see what it comes up right like what does it mean when a guy does this and chat gpt <laughs> is like yeah, it means like this and this, but it also means like this and this. <laughs> or what are the common stereotypes of people from X country? 
you know, like every time she has a doubt, she goes and asks. And I think it's funny. Like it's, it's a nice way actually to, you know, um, have ChatGPT be your advisor or something like that. But yeah, I think we, we are going to look back in 10, 20 years to the crazy times when AI emerged. Mm, that's true. And it's emerging faster than anything. It's really, really fast. But now I have one question that I would love to ask you. What advice would you give someone or someone who's beginning a career in marketing? It's yes. something I'm always getting. Uh, people are asking me, hey, Majid, whoever you ask, whoever is, is a guest, ask them how should someone start in their field? Like I, I have three or four emails which ask me, hey, we, have, we want to pursue a career in marketing. So what would be the advice you would like to give them? So it's an advice I didn't truly follow myself, <laughs> but I would if I would be now 20 again, um, do marketing plus something else. So, you know, if you want to be in marketing, do marketing and product, do marketing and development, do marketing and business, do market. So marketing is a great tool. For, I, I think, you know, Having studied business, I think it's helpful for anyone in any field. Studying law is a good choice for everyone in every field. And I think marketing is a great uh, career path, but I think it's supercharged when you have a second career path. Mm -hmm. So if you ask me, I would have done graphic design plus marketing. That would have been my good combination. Uh, and I do, or I would have um, learned to code. Uh, much more. I know some things, but not a lot. And I do feel like in 50 years, if you cannot code, you're going to be illiterate, right? The same, same as you're not able to write or read. So it's going to be the same when you are, uh, you know, in 50 years, you will need to learn to code. And I do think if you're trying to get into marketing, get into marketing plus something else. I think it gives you much more, the, the, it doubles the playground or triples mm. the playground, right? And it also helps you to value marketing, but also, you know, have a way to combine it with other things and always have this extra layer of value that you bring to a company. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Uh, this has been very, very great. I asked a lot of questions. It was very insightful, Monica. Firstly, thank you again for sharing your insights, expertise and experiences with us. Do you want to say something as a closing statement for our guests and uh, for our uh, listeners? Sorry. Um, yeah, if they are interested in marketing, I think it's, um, you know, great field, no matter if you are very, very creative, uh, very driven or very analytical. Um, in terms of, um, you know, career paths, I think, as I was saying, be, being a generalist has its, you know, like risks, but if you're a curious person, I think it's been very rewarding to be able to pick up any topic and, you know, go with the flow. I think that's something developers are very comfortable saying, you know, like, Anything, I just Google and I figure it out, right? And I think that should be a good a good way to go about anything, to dare to just, okay, I have never done this, but that doesn't mean I cannot figure this one out, right? So I would say if you are that kind of person, probably marketing is a good place for you. Um, and yeah, I hope you enjoyed my thoughts. And if you disagree, uh, let us know in the comments and I'll be you know, happy to debate with everyone about it. Cool. That was very positive for me, at least I can personally tell you because I, I know everyone's experiences can be different yeah. and it's always good to learn from other people. Mm -hmm. um, and I, 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 today was uh, different, like, because I've worked in FinTech talking about the industry and seeing how you're approaching it is much more different than how we were doing it at, at uh, Griff, you know. So the, thank you again. Uh, and to our listeners, thank you for tuning in to the executives. If you found this episode valuable, don't forget to subscribe. And like Monica said, comment and argue if you want <laughs> and share it with your network. <laughs> I can see the, the fighting 
from monica so until next time this is majid signing off